My name is Mary Niekamp. This talk is being recorded as part of the 175th celebration of the founding of the St. Henry Parish. It identifies the saints and the symbols depicted in the stained glass windows of our church. These windows were purchased from the Artistic Glass Painting Company of Cincinnati, who had them imported from Munich, Germany. In 1839, just two years after the town was founded, the 18 Catholic families living in the area asked the Bishop of Cincinnati for permission to form a parish. Of these 18 families, only four of them lived in the town. The rest lived on homesteads, mostly to the east of St. Henry. After receiving permission from the archdiocese, the parish built their first church, which was made of logs. It was completed in July of 1840, and it stood just west of where the library is today. The parish continued to grow, and in 1854 they made plans for a new church. They now had 41 families, but still only 13 of these were living in the town. This second church was built of bricks and stood where the priest house is today. It was dedicated in December of 1855, just 15 years after they had built their log church in aping the Christ child. Christ's outstretched arms symbolize invitation, welcoming the children of St. Henry. In the Gospel of Mark, Christ says, let the little children come to me. The priest in the window is St. Vincent de Paul. You can recognize him in holy pictures by the little skull cap he wears. Children are a special symbol for St. Vincent. In the 1600s, he would go through the streets of Paris and gather all the children who had been abandoned there during the night. St. Vincent collected money from the rich to establish homes and hospitals for these orphans and for the aged. Through his social work, he changed the thinking of the world. In many parishes today, there are St. Vincent de Paul societies who still labor for the poor. In his hand, St. Vincent holds an escalloped shell, which is a symbol for baptism. The stole around his neck represents the yoke of man's sin borne by Christ. This stole is decorated with Greek crosses whose four arms are of equal length. There are five Greek crosses on every altar where they represent the five wounds of Christ. Sister Angela Morisi, wearing a nun's habit, lived in the 1500s and is the patron saint of teachers. She holds a baby that is being baptized by St. Vincent. She was blessed with a vision in which she saw maidens ascending to heaven on a ladder of light. God revealed to her that she would establish a company to promote the welfare of souls. She did this when she founded the Ursuline Order, which was the first teaching order of women to be established in the church. Before her death, St. Angela foretold that the Ursuline Order would last until the end of the world. St. Angela has a cincture around her waist. This rope is a symbol of chastity and self-restraint. The left hand of the angel that you see in this window is holding on to a baby, but notice the angel's right hand. Whenever you see an angel with its right hand extended, the palm open and facing downward, it is a guardian angel. The man under the palm tree is a Muslim. As a young priest, St. Vincent was captured by barbary pirates and sold into slavery in Africa. After two years, he converted his Muslim master and returned with him to France. The acanthus leaves at the edge of the roof represent heavenly gardens. You can see acanthus leaves and grapes on the capitals of the pillars of our church. Moving to the second window on the west side, we see a monstrance with a cross-embellished host in the quarterfoil at the top. This is emblematic of the Holy Eucharist. The inscription at the bottom of this window says, to the everlasting memory of the St. Henry Men's Society. The kneeling figures are St. Henry and his wife, St. Cunigunda. They are beseeching Mary and the Christ child for blessings on the town of St. Henry that appears at the bottom of the window. 
you can see the 1902 rectory, this 1897 church, a convent building that was planned but never built, the 1903 school, some houses in the trees, and a building in the country that is the Himmelgarn convent that was established by the missionaries of the Most Precious Blood in 1852. Mary and the Christ Child are shown inside a cloud-like aureole surrounded by rays of glory. The Christ Child has his right hand raised in benediction. His thumb and two fingers are extended to represent the Holy Trinity. The other two fingers are curled down and represent the twofold nature of Christ, his godhood and his manhood. In his left hand, he holds a blue cross-tipped orb, which symbolizes the triumph of Christ's gospel over the sin of the world. Mary's crown and scepter identify her as the Queen of Heaven. Her green robe symbolizes immortality. St. Henry became the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 1014. He was the most important ruler in Europe at the start of the 11th century. During his reign, he attempted to bring moral reform in the church, especially among the clergy. He worked to stop the practice of clerical marriages and the buying and selling of ecclesiastical promotions. He repressed abuses, established justice, and protected religion throughout his realm. The sword at St. Henry's side is one of his symbols. St. Cunigunda and St. Henry took vows of virginity on their wedding day. When certain people at court accused St. Cunigunda of being unfaithful, she proved her innocence by an ordeal of fire. Trusting in God, she walked on red-hot plowshares without being harmed. St. Cunigunda had riches and power, both of which she used to help the poor. After St. Henry's death, she entered a convent. The symbol in the quatrefoil of the third window is an open book, which symbolizes the Word of God. The German words shown in this book are Heilige Schrift, which means holy writing. The inscription at the bottom of the window says, To the everlasting memory of the St. Syriacus Young Men's Society. St. Syriacus is an obscure saint today, and you may wonder why he was chosen to be honored with a window in our church. However, he was very important to the parish when this church was built. In 1885, there was a smallpox epidemic, and many people died. The Catholic parishes in this area each chose a saint to intercede for their protection. St. Henry chose St. Syriacus, who was known as a great healer. They promised to honor him forever, and they celebrated his feast day, August the 8th, as a holy day. Forever did not last very long, because few people in St. Henry know about him today. Perhaps it's time we again honor St. Syriacus and fulfill the promise made by our ancestors. The figures and the symbols in this window are related to the death of St. Syriacus, who was martyred during the Roman persecution of the Christians in 303 A.D. When St. Syriacus and 20 of his companions were discovered giving aid to Christians who were forced to work on the Roman baths, they were arrested, tortured, and then beheaded. Two of his companions, St. Largus and St. Samargus, are also shown in this window. All three wear dalmatics, which identify them as ordained deacons, which was one of the three major orders in the early church, priest, deacon, and subdeacon. The brown dalmatic is shaped like a cross and refers to the passion of Christ. St. Syriacus has his arms outstretched in invitation, welcoming his martyrdom. His hair has been tonsured. The hair on the crown of his head was shaved, leaving a ring of hair around the rest of his head, which symbolizes the crown of thorns. The open book represents the word of God. The unbroken chain represents the power of Satan in our lives. If the chain is broken, it represents our victory over sin. The background buildings show the city of Rome. The soldiers served in the army of the emperor Diocletian, who persecuted the Christians. 
There are crossed keys in the quatrefoil above the fourth window. These are symbolic of the Pope, who has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The gold key is called absolution and opens the door of heaven to all those who are sorry for their sins. The silver key is excommunication and locks the heavenly door on the willful sinner who does not repent. The inscription at the bottom of this window says, To the Everlasting Memory of the St. Aloysius Boys Society. St. Aloysius lived in the latter part of the 1500s. He was the oldest son of a very rich and powerful Italian family. His father was a member of the European nobility, and St. Aloysius spent several years as a page at the court of King Philip II of Spain. In this window, Aloysius is dressed in robes that reflect the wealth of his family and his role at court. Although exposed to the riches of the world, St. Aloysius developed an ardent desire to serve God. His father wanted him to be a great soldier and strongly opposed his vocation. However, at the age of 16, Aloysius renounced his birthright and joined the Society of Jesus. During the outbreak of the Black Plague in 1591, St. Aloysius volunteered to care for the poorest and the most miserable victims. He himself caught the plague, and after three months of great suffering, he died. St. Aloysius was 23 when he died and had not yet become a priest. He was an ordained acolyte. This was the highest of the four minor orders leading to the priesthood, porter, lector, exorcist, and acolyte. We are reminded of his station by the acolyte pictured in the window, who was wearing a surplus and swinging a censer. Again we see a cloud-like aureole which surrounds the Blessed Virgin Mary who is holding the Christ child. Jesus has his arms outstretched, welcoming St. Aloysius, who desired to devote himself body and soul to the service of God. The lilies in the hand of Mary and those by the kneeler identify St. Aloysius as the patron saint of youth and purity. The rose color of Mary's gown signifies joy in the midst of penance. Notice the man in the background who is praying with his hands crossed over his chest. This form of prayer, which was common years ago, became the inspiration for the pretzel. In the past, Many people kept the black fast during Holy Week and especially on Good Friday. Those keeping the fast could eat no food that came from an animal. Thus, they could not eat meat, milk, eggs, lard, butter, or even bread, because bread contained lard. Therefore, they mixed flour, salt, and water into a dough and rolled it into long strips. The ends of the strips were crossed over one another and the dough was baked. Look again at the man in prayer. Follow one of his hands to his elbow, and then across his shoulders and down to his other elbow, and back to his second hand. You can now see the shape of a pretzel, which represents a man in prayer. The quatrefoil in this last window on the west side of the church has a dove with an olive branch. This is a symbol of peace. The inscription at the bottom says, To the Everlasting Memory of the Order of the C.K. of A. The Catholic Knights of America were founded in 1877 and were still active in 2005. They originally sold life insurance to their members, but one of their major missions was to raise money for the needs of the church. This window depicts the biblical story of the Good Samaritan. It tells about a Jewish man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell among robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and then went off, leaving him half dead. A Jewish priest happened to be going down the same road. He saw him, but continued on. Likewise, there was a Levite who came the same way, saw him, and went on. But a Samaritan came along, saw him, and was moved to pity. He approached him and dressed his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He then put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, where he cared for him. This story is a contrast between apathy and compassion, between the unbending indifference of the priest and the Levite, 
and the healing love of Christ. Because there was enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews, a Samaritan was not expected to help a Jew. We can recognize that the Samaritan is Christ by the tri-radiant nimbus around his head. This three-rayed circle of light can only be used for one of the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. The red color of Christ's robe stands for love and fervor. The two men going on their way, ignoring their injured countrymen, are a Jewish priest and a Levite. The priest was a sacred minister who offered sacrifice at the altar of Holocaust. The Levite was also a sacred minister, but of lower rank than the priest. The rocks in the window are a symbol of God. The Bible often refers to God as a rock. In the Psalms, he is called my rock and my fortress. The flask in the hand of Jesus represents the inexhaustible mercy of God, and the oil symbolizes healing. The evergreen tree is a symbol of everlasting life, while the thistle represents earthly sorrow and sin. We will now move back to the sanctuary to look at the first window on the east side of the church. This window honors St. Gaspar del Buffalo, who was the founder of the Society of the Most Precious Blood. Many of the symbols used in this window relate to the blood of Christ. St. Gaspar is a relatively new saint. He was canonized in 1954. He lived in Italy in the early 1800s and showed great concern for the sick, the poor, and the underprivileged. He preached to gangs of bandits who killed without mercy and succeeded in bringing many of them back to the Christian faith. The Society of the Most Precious Blood in America was established under the leadership of Francis de Sales Brunner. Its priests, sisters, and brothers arrived at Maria Stein in 1846. In 1852, they built the Himmelgarten Convent just west of St. Henry. And since that time, the priests of the Most Precious Blood have faithfully served this parish, and they still do so today. The symbol in the quatrefoil is called the pelican in her piety. The pelican is shown plucking her breast to feed her young. A myth exists that in time of famine, the female pelican saves her young by feeding them her own blood. This is symbolic of Christ shedding his blood for our salvation. The inscription at the bottom of the window says, To the everlasting memory of all the deceased priests of the missionaries of the most precious blood. This window was donated by the Reverend Dominic Schunk, who was the pastor of our parish in 1905 when the windows were purchased. The picture hanging over the altar is titled, Our Lady of the Most Precious Blood. It is easily recognized. The Virgin Mary is holding Jesus, who has a chalice in his right hand. There is an open missal on the altar. The left-hand page depicts the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. The right-hand page has a quotation from the Book of Revelations. The words are written in Latin and mean, Blessed are they that wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. There is a human skull under the missal. It symbolizes the skull of Adam and represents his fall into sin, which brings death to the soul. In art, the skull of Adam is often depicted at the foot of the cross, where his sin is washed away by drops of blood from the crucified Christ. The bell on the altar signifies welcome and an invitation to worship. Before Vatican II, bells were rung at Mass during the consecration to announce the coming of Christ in the Eucharist. The initials IHS on the altar cloth are the first three letters in the Greek word Ithis, which means Jesus. These initials can be found in many places. There are three of them in our church. There is the one in this window, another one in the rose window in the east transept, and one in the transom over the double doors leading from the main vestibule into the church. IHS is often engraved on chalices and is used in the decoration of vestments. You can also find these letters engraved on some tombstones. St. Gaspar wears a black cassock that has 33 buttons down the front one for each year in the life of Christ. When the precious blood priests wore cassocks, 
They often wore a gold cross across their chest. This was a special privilege given to the Society of the Precious Blood. As a practice of penance, St. Gaspar carried a large wooden cross wherever he preached. Here he holds a crucifix, which is a cross with the body of Christ hung upon it. St. Gaspar has his right arm raised and his finger points to heaven to remind us that it is through the shedding of Christ's blood that we are saved. The next window is dedicated to the everlasting memory of the Married Women's Society. There is a censer in the quarterfoil at the top of this window. The censer is a sign of priestly function and also represents our prayers rising to God. In the Psalms, we have the phrase, Let my prayers come like incense before you. Mary is the holiest of all the saints, and the Feast of the Assumption is the greatest feast day that the Church celebrates in her honor. The golden background and the golden rays of glory coming down on the figure of Mary indicate the sacredness of the subject depicted. This is the only window in our Church that has a golden background. The twelve-starred nimbus surrounding Mary's head distinguishes her from any other saint. These twelve stars have several meanings. They stand for the twelve apostles and for the twelve tribes of Israel. Mary's long flowing hair is a symbol of penance. This relates to the biblical story of the woman washing the feet of Jesus with tears and drying them with her hair. Mary's hands are folded in prayer. Her white gown indicates holiness and purity of soul, and the blue of her mantle stands for wisdom, truth, and charity. The kneeling angel is looking upward. This signifies honor and glory. The palm branch in the hand of the angel indicates victory, Mary's victory over death. The little angels in the window are cherubim. The cherubim are one of the nine choirs of angels. In art, you usually find the cherubim represented as baby angels called cherubs. There are clouds under Mary's feet. Because clouds hide heaven, they are a symbol of the unseen God. The Assumption of Mary has been part of the Catholic faith since the earliest days of the Church. Tradition holds that upon the death of Mary, her soul was taken immediately into heaven, and her body was buried by the apostles. After three days, Jesus returned her soul from heaven and united it to her body, and then Mary was taken body and soul into heaven. In 1950, Pope Pius XII defined the Assumption of Mary as a truth revealed by God, thus making it a truth that all Catholics are obliged to believe. At the top of the next window is the Lamb on the Book of Seven Seals. This is from the Book of Revelations. Christ is the Lamb of God, who opens the seven seals which reveal punishments that fall upon mankind for his sins. The banner with the red cross is the banner of victory, Christ's victory over death. The red cross represents suffering and the white field is a symbol of purity. The Lamb on the Book of Seals is part of the official seal of the Society of the Most Precious Blood. The inscription at the bottom of this window says, To the Everlasting Memory of the St. Rose Young Ladies Society. St. Rose of Lima was born in Peru in South America. She is the first canonized saint born in the Western Hemisphere. St. Rose wears the habit of a Dominican nun, but she is really a tertiary. She belonged to the Third Order of St. Dominic which was an organization of lay people who desired to live the spirit of the Dominican order in their lives. St. Rose lived in the early 1600s and died at the age of 31. She was devoted to God and at a very young age made a vow of virginity. She rejected temporal comforts for spiritual rewards. She practiced constant and severe penance. She wore a hair shirt studded with nails. On her head, she wore a circlet of silver that had 90 points in imitation of the crown of thorns. St. Rose has a rosary hanging from her waist. In the 13th century, the Blessed Virgin Mary revealed the devotion of the rosary to St. Dominic. Her veil is a symbol of modesty and renunciation of the world. 
The bread and the bowl are symbolic of the desire of St. Rose to feed the sick and the needy. The roses are a reminder of a story from St. Rose's life. When she was still a young girl, she would take baskets of bread from her parents' house to feed the poor. One day her father saw her and angrily asked what she was doing. Although she was frightened, she opened her cloak and found her basket filled with roses. In the background you can see a crucifix. One of the forms of penance practiced by St. Rose was dragging a heavy wooden cross around her garden. You can see a nun reading a book. On the cover of the book is the German word for scripture. The quatrefoil in the fourth window on the east side contains two stone tablets. These tablets represent the Ten Commandments. Unlike the traditional Catholic 3-7 division, where the first three express our duties to God and the next seven refer to our duties to man, here they are divided five and five. The first five represent our duties of piety, and the second five those of virtue. St. Agnes was a Christian girl in Rome when the persecution of the Christians began under the Roman Emperor Diocletian in 300 AD. St. Agnes was very beautiful and at a young age dedicated her life to God. When she was 12, she refused to offer incense at the altar of the Roman goddess Minerva. St. Agnes was arrested but showed no fear of torture or death. Because she treasured her virginity, she was sent to a house of prostitution. Here her innocence was protected by divine providence. When a young man approached her, he was struck blind. After an attempt to burn her failed, she was beheaded. She died at the age of 13. She is the patroness of bodily purity. This window shows the glorious apparition of St. Agnes to her mother and father who were praying and weeping at her grave. They saw her in heavenly glory with a white lamb. The lamb symbolizes innocence and is a special symbol of St. Agnes. She holds a palm branch in her hand, which symbolizes martyrdom and her victory over death. The gold color of her robe indicates holiness, and the lilies by the cross refer to her virginity and her purity. The rays emanating from the Latin cross at the head of the grave make it a cross of glory. The Colosseum and the temple in the background represent the city of Rome where St. Agnes was martyred. The quatrefoil above the last window on the east side has a triangle and an eye. The triangle represents the Holy Trinity and the eye is the all-seeing eye of God. The dedication at the bottom of the window says, To the everlasting memory of the Third Order of St. Francis of Assisi. The Third Order of St. Francis of Assisi was an organization of lay people called tertiaries who wished to live the spirit of that order in their lives. St. Francis lived in Italy in the early 1200s. He was the son of very wealthy parents. As a boy, he dreamed of becoming a knight. After going to war, he was disillusioned and recognized the emptiness of his life. He renounced his wealth and freely embraced poverty. He prayed for long hours at a time and was filled with divine love. He possessed the gifts of prophecy and miracles. One day, while praying before the crucifix, St. Francis felt the eyes of Christ gazing at him, and he heard a voice saying three times, Francis, go and repair my house which you see is falling down. Francis found a small chapel called St. Mary of the Porta Cuncula that was forsaken and in ruins, and he and his companions restored it. In this window, we see St. Francis praying in the chapel of the Porta Cuncula, where he had a vision of Christ and the Blessed Virgin. Jesus has his right hand raised in benediction, and Mary has her hands folded in prayer. St. Francis has his arms stretched out in welcome. He is welcoming the stigmata, the five wounds of Christ. He received these wounds in his hands, feet, and side about two years before his death. The five burning candles in the background are symbolic of these five wounds. The escallop shell behind the head of Christ indicates pilgrimage. Christ had promised St. Francis 
that penitent sinners who visited this chapel would gain a plenary indulgence. In our first window, we also saw an escallop shell, where I told you it symbolized baptism, and it does. Baptism is the beginning of our Christian pilgrimage through life. The cincture around the waist of St. Francis is indicative of chastity and self-restraint. The ferns, because they grow in shaded and shadowy places, are a symbol of solitary humility and sincerity. St. Francis is hailed as the most lovable of all the saints by both Catholics and Protestants. He began the custom of using nativity sets to depict the birth of Christ and is credited with the custom of singing Christmas carols. While we are at the back of the church, we can look at the stained glass windows in the choir loft. There are four windows in the loft, but you can only see two of them from downstairs. The window on the west side has the alpha in the quatrefoil at its top. In the quatrefoil at the top of the east window is the omega. These two letters, the alpha and the omega, are the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet, and they symbolize Christ, who is the beginning and the end of all things. In the center of the west window is a lyre. This was a popular instrument in ancient times. In the center of the east window is a triangle and two horns. It seems very fitting that the windows in the choir loft are decorated with musical instruments. We shall now move back to the rose windows in the transepts. The German inscription in the east window is to the everlasting memory of Henry Rangers who donated this window. All the symbols in this window are related to Christ. In the center of the window is a flaming heart surrounded by a crown of thorns. This symbolizes the sacred heart of Jesus. Moving clockwise from the top, you see a cross with a crown of thorns. This represents the passion of Christ. Next is the intertwined initials IHS, which we have talked about before. They are the first three letters in the Greek word for Jesus. At the bottom left are the initials I-N-R-I. These are the first letters in the Latin words that mean Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pilate had this inscription put on the cross when Jesus was crucified. At the top left is a golden cross and crown, which represent Christ the King. There are three small windows below the rose window. The German inscription at the bottom of each window says, O most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Two of the windows have lilies, and they symbolize the Annunciation. The middle window has a Glastonbury thorn. This is a symbol of the Nativity because it blooms at Christmas time. We now come to the last window. All the symbols in the West Rose window are related to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is dedicated in everlasting memory of Joseph and Emma Moeller who donated it. We have three combined symbols in the center of this window. A flaming heart surrounded by roses is a symbol of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We have lilies that signify her virginity. And we have the heart of Mary pierced by a sword, which indicates the sacred heart of Mary. On the top right is a crown with lilies. This symbolizes the Queen of Heaven. On the bottom right is the rosary. Each decade of the rosary is dedicated to an event in the life of Christ or the life of the Virgin Mary. At the bottom left are the intertwined initials A and M. These are the first letters in the words Ave Maria, which is Latin for Hail Mary. At the top left is a flaming heart with seven swords. The seven swords represent the seven sorrows of Mary. The first three are from the childhood of Christ, the prophecy of Simeon, the flight into Egypt, the loss of Jesus in the temple. The last four are events regarding his death, the betrayal of Christ, the crucifixion, the descent from the cross, and the burial of Christ. The three windows below the rose window have an inscription that says, Sweetheart of Mary, be our refuge. The two windows of lilies again symbolize the Annunciation. 
The center window has roses, which are a common symbol of Our Lady. She is called a rose without thorns. Tradition holds that the rose grew without thorns in the Garden of Eden. After the fall of Adam and Eve, it took on thorns to remind man of his sin. However, it kept its beauty and its fragrance to recall the perfection of paradise. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this audio presentation on the stained glass windows.